Hello, my name is Tom Marino, Cornell class of 1978, and a founding board member of City Lax, the largest ermine lacrosse program in the country, serving over 3,000 inner, inner city student athletes in the five boroughs of New York City. I'd like to welcome everyone to the City Lax Heroes of 9-11 series whereby we plan to honor and recognize the memories of lacrosse community members who were lost 20 years ago in the tragedy on 9-11-2001. Our first event this evening is honoring the memory of Eamon McEnany, someone that was very near and dear to me. I had the distinct honor of calling Eamon a close friend and a teammate. We were teammates on the 1976 and 1977 undefeated NCAA national championship teams. Eamon was the best friend and teammate anyone could have. He always had your back. And he was the fiercest competitor I ever knew. Today, we have a panel discussion remembering Eamon. Our panel is Kevin McEnany, one of Eamon's children, Mike French and Chris Kane, fellow teammates at Cornell and also close friends of Amon's. And Richie Moran, our close friend and legendary coach of Cornell lacrosse. Our moderator today is Jeremy Schaff, sports writer, author, 11 time Emmy Award winner from ESPN. I hope you enjoy the show. off the page, page drills it in, here it is again. McEnany is, is probably one of the best that's ever played the game and setting up teams. It's just unbelievable, and it's all the boys in the world. Okay, Cornell off to a good start. What do I remember when I see number 10? Outstanding leader, competitor, ferocious. I would say he was the ultimate teammate. He loved his teammates. He told them point blank he did. In fact, in a championship game at Brown University, we were down 7-2 at halftime. And he even said, coach, can I say a word to the team? We set up two plays. Drew him one aboard, and there were the two plays we were going to start the second half with. And then Eamon spoke, and he said, I just wanted to tell you something. We're not going to lose this game because we love each other. I love you. And if love means anything to any of us, we'll, we'll play harder than we've ever played. And we sure did. Amy McEnany, class of 77, Elmont, New York. That was the great Richie Moran talking about the great Eamon McEnany. And we are here now almost 20 years after Eamon's death on 9-11 to talk about his life and his legacy with some of the people who were closest to him, three teammates and one of his three sons, Kevin McEnany. We have Kevin McEnany with us. We have Mike French with us. We have Tom Marino with us. And we have Chris Kane with us as well. And gentlemen, it really is for me um, an honor to have a chance just to talk about Eamon McEnany with the four of you. Um, uh, as you guys know, uh, my dad played lacrosse at Cornell. I went to Cornell. Uh, growing up, Eamon McEnany in my household was a kind of superhero. And um, you guys knew much better than I did. You were closer to him than I was, but he, he meant something to people like me who knew him only a little because he stood for something. Um, you know, Kevin, you, you, were, you were so young when your dad died. Um, and now it's been, 
as we said, almost 20 years. Uh, when you think about your dad, what, what are the things that come to mind? You know, it's, it's, it can often be a tricky question. You know, I was, I was so young when he passed away, but um, through, and I, I do have my memories of him, um, you know, a lot of fun times, um, you know, he showed up at a lot of my sports games and uh, he, w he was always there to kind of, you know, he'd, he'd come home late from work, but we'd always stay up and, you know, get really excited at any opportunity we had to see him. Um, he would do things like he'd come home with, you know, creepy Halloween masks on, uh, you know, in October just to scare us late at night. And, uh, you know, he was always challenging us to, um, even, even at a young age, to sort of uh, be a little bit more bolder, um, you know, whether it was teaching us how to swim and maybe not, you know, the, uh, you know, the most step-by-step uh, -step process or... Uh, what, what does that mean exactly? Just throw you in the deep end of the pool? Yeah, you know, um, sort of. Yeah, that was kind of that was kind of his approach to teaching, and uh, that doesn't seem surprising from Amy Mac. Kevin, he used to refer to you and your twin brother. You won't believe give and go. They're unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. You won't believe pick and roll. <laughs> yeah, I've heard give and go, frickin' crack. Uh, a lot of nicknames I wish might have stuck a little better, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's you know that's that's what I remember is just you know, a strong spirit trying to, uh, trying to really embrace things and embrace them quickly. And, um, you know, coming to real, you know, coming to the 20th anniversary of what happened, um, you know, it's given me a lot of time to reflect and, um, not only on my own life and, and different aspects of being part of, you know, the McEnany family, how that's helped raise me, but also, now that I'm more of an adult, you know, what can I take from the kind of person that my father was and, you know, how can I embrace that? And, um, you know, how can I, you know, live life a little bit more fully with that in mind? So I'm excited to be here today and I'm excited to hear everybody's stories. Um, I'm excited to learn more about my father and um, eager to, uh, to embrace that. It seems to me, you know, when, when people get together to talk about Eamon McEnany, um, it doesn't do it justice to say there's no shortage of stories. He's one of those people, and you don't meet many of them in the course of even, um, you know, a lifetime, who, who light up every room they walk into, who command everyone's attention, um, who people are drawn to through their magnetism and their charisma and their personality. You guys... You guys, Chris and Tom and Mike, saw so much of that. Um, Chris, for someone who never met Eamon McEnany, um, how would you describe that aura around him? Well, um, he was just a phenomenal human being. Um, my intro to the show was I played midfield all through high school my first year at Cornell. And then the first or second week, into practice, Richie and Bonesy sit me down and they go, we want to make you a defenseman. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. You want me to guard Eamon, Mike, and John every day. So what you're <laughs> telling me? <laughs> I was like, this is, you know, coach, I'm doing really well being a six, 16 midfielder. I'm on the sixth midfielder. I think I can work my way up to the fifth midfield next year. And then he said, listen, just please, you know, do this for me. And, and it was a little unbecoming, Richie, you know, begging me to do this. In actuality, that's how I think it was. Um, in actuality, he actually said, listen, you're playing mid defense starting tomorrow. Go get a big stick. And that was it. And so I really think I have a, a front row seat because for the next two years, I guarded Eamon and I live with Eamon. And uh, if I didn't have the best seat in the house, I certainly was uh, bingo front row. Um, and anyone who didn't know him, he just, he did. He had an aura about him. I'll tell you, people who did know him, they certainly, everyone who did know him close for one time in their life, 
definitely hated him for 15 minutes in their life because he was the type of guy you did not want to play. I got you last with. Just don't even start. You're not going to go there. Go down to the minor leagues. This is the big leagues, pal. Um, you know, he, he was just the greatest. I mean, and I say it lovingly. You know, you hated the guy, but um, so lovingly. Um, he was just sometimes he could be crazy and drive you crazy. Yeah. 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 I would just add to that. Um, um, I did not live in, uh, with Eamon at school, but, um, and I, and I don't want to, I, I, there's something else I want to say later, but I can just tell you one story why you would hate him for 15 minutes. And it wasn't me, but we, at, at, at every game, um, right after the national anthem, uh, Levinsky, myself, and uh, Eamon would be on the restraining line. Tommy, I, I don't know if he did it when you, uh, in 77 or 78. What, but he would come clock, up. To, the clock? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going into. He would come every up. Every game. He would come up. Of course, I got the, the Yale uh, linebacker, who's six foot three, 220. And he would come up and he'd say, Frenchman, tick, tick, tick. What time is it? And he'd be looking up at my my hulk of a defenseman and i'd go explosion time and the guys i i eyes would be going like this what's this guy doing they didn't go over and tommy it, it, it happened i guess year in year every, 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 every game he'd do it every he'd do game. It. and so I, but the ultimate result was within the next five minutes it was five nothing yeah that was it's interesting I, I look at physically and mentally I felt bad for the defensemen that were covering him because in two seconds, he was in their mind in two more seconds. They were, you know, trying to cover him and, and it was nonstop the whole game. He has just a steadying influence Gene, on his entire team. Well, they always look for him and, and he's an attack man and he tries to be in the right spot so that he can help. He's so quick. And Cornell now on the attack. Hopkins a man short. Hopkins down, three to nothing. McEnany, and you're right, Gene. McEnany scores again at Cornell, four to nothing. Yeah. But he started every game that way with the clock. Tick, tick, tick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the guys, but my guy would look at me and he'd go, what's going on with that guy? And I said, you're going to find out. <laughs> yep, exactly. You're going to find out. <laughs> As, as an athlete, um, you know, we've seen the footage. Today you can watch some of the games. But can you describe what it was, what it was like, Tom, watching him in motion? Well, I'll give you – I had the pleasure of first meeting Eamon through competition in high school. I went to Massapequa High School. He was at Sawanek High School. So it was probably my – sophomore year in high school that I played against him in lacrosse. And then in the fall, I play against him in football. And um, this is no surprise to anyone. Eamon was not short of confidence in high school. He was very cocky. And you know what? He could support it. He could carry it. And he was just a great athlete, you know, day one when I saw him. But he was, and I think Chris said it before, he was the guy you wanted to beat. And we beat them in football, but we didn't beat them in lacrosse. Ten guys, grown-ups, who would go watch his high school games. Who does that? He goes, <laughs> yeah. Monica, just, just because he was so phenomenal. He was so phenomenal. Just go watch his high school games. They had this little group. Every Wednesday or Friday night, they'd go watch his games. I'm like... No one did that in any of my high school games. <laughs> Not at all. Right? I mean, they wanted to go see the show. So, so who nicknamed him? I mean, it, it seems like it was inevitable. Someone would. But but was it one person in particular who called him the Wild Irish Rose initially? I think it came out in the was it Sports Rich? Illustrated article. Oh, it, did, did it come from Richie, though? I don't know. I, I don't I know. Just know that I don't there know. was an article, and, and I think they referred to him as that, um, which, yeah. which I think is a pretty 
pretty good assessment. You know, okay. Wild and the Rose, you know? Totally, totally agree. Our junior year, Tommy and I's junior year, we beat Yale 16 to one in the locker room after the game. Eamon picks a fight with like a fifth string midfielder for not trying hard enough. Oh, yeah. And we're all like, this is crazy. But try to follow me here along with this one. If Captain Kirk beamed that whole team up in the Yale locker room and put him in a war zone somewhere right then, and Captain Kirk said, McEnany, you get in that foxhole. Kane, which one you want to go in? I'm going with him. Yeah. The guy who you just picking a fight with, I would like to go in that foxhole also. Just let me get a little away from him. He was he was competitive. I'm telling you, when you're on a team that wins 42 games in a row, you have a lot of competitive kids on this team, no question. But Eamon, he was really the straw that stirred the drink. Everyone would follow this guy. He was feisty, um, very religious, very spiritual. Um, we played Navy in the uh, semifinals at Cornell, and I made a gigantic blunder. We had exams that Saturday. Well, we had a training meal at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning because these kids had exams. Some of the exams went over. We probably should have pushed the game to 7 o'clock at night. But we played at four. And when we started the game at four o'clock, we're minus five starters. We got down in the game, came back, tied the game up, got down again, and Navy won. Walking off the field, I'm devastated because I realized it was my mistake. He puts his arm around me. He says, Coach, I'm going to tell you something. The next three years, we're never going to lose a game. And you know, I, I said, I mean, I appreciate that, but I, I think I let you guys down. He said, no. He said, uh, we let everybody down. We let ourselves down. We let you down. We had a tremendous crowd for that game. I think it was like 12,000, 13,000. And he said, you know, the fans appreciate what we did up to the final score. And he said, just remember what I said. We're never going to lose a game. What's it like for you hearing these stories? Um, it's, it's, it's nice. It, it helps paint a picture, you know, um, to better understand that ferocity and, uh, and, and the way that he approached sports and competition. Um, it, it's inspiring. Uh, it, it definitely... You know, I'm kind of a, I can be a bit of like a docile guy. I'm not usually the most uh, confrontational, but um, hearing that, you know, it kind of lights a little bit of a fire in me. And uh, I hope that, you know, I can, can carry that with me and, and be a little bit uh, more competitive in certain things I do in my own, my own life. I, I do want to talk about, um, you know, the 76 championship game, because it is one of those iconic moments in time. And it's, uh, you know, it, the way that, that Cornell came back. Mike, can, can you describe um, what it was like playing in that game and being there with Eamon in those crucial moments? You had one of the all-time games anyone's ever had uh, in lacrosse, in the national championship spotlight. And you guys were, were um, you know, attached in an almost uh, mystical way to each other on the field. Um, we had a goaltender that stood on his head, right? Um, played great. We had our midfield guys and our defense were all big contributors. Interestingly enough, Jeremy, this was our goal, and it was always our goal when we were playing in a regular season, was to, to really get up on a team. So, but in the third quarter, we'd be out. You know, I was promoting that, and I know that Eamon was, Jonathan was, and I'm sure that, you know, Tommy, because we wanted – the other guys who could start at any other team to get time. The, the game against Maryland, which went into overtime, was the first time I'd ever played the whole game. Mm -hmm. And the first time I'd ever played overtime. And so 
I had more time to score a lot of goals is what I'm trying to tell you. But um, it was it was really a, a great, you know, effort. We should have won it in regulation. Um, you know, Eamon was all over the field. You know, our we, we controlled at you know, everybody was saying that that Maryland was gonna run us out of there. At the end of the day, they ran out of gas and it wasn't us. They had a seven two lead at half. Um, you know, when we, when we got the ball, they were on their heels. And so, um, you know, it was kind of a little bit like David versus Goliath because although we were both undefeated, everybody thought Big Bad Maryland was, they'd won last year, they won in 75, that they were gonna, they were gonna win again. We never put statistics on the board. Only statistic we ever put on the board was the amount of ground balls that somebody picked up. And what we did, we never talked about being undefeated. Every day we stepped on a field. We stepped on a field with the attitude of an underdog. Mike French and Eamon McEnany put the icing on the cake. French scores his seventh goal on an assist from McEnany with nine seconds left. French's seven goals ties a record and his 20 tournament points sets one. The final, Cornell 16, Maryland 13. The college lacrosse dream game turns out to be just that. Cornell, having won the first NCAA title in 1971, has won its second in true championship fashion. French and Urso will be gone next year. When I think, when I have a picture of him in my mind, I think of, uh, I guess, the 77 championship game, uh, by which time you'd ab abandoned him, Mike, uh, you know, after graduation. And uh, I, I don't know, did he have one tooth in his head when he's doing the thing with Frank Gifford on the yeah. field? Yeah. I'm not sure that he had more than two teeth. I mean. He, he would take his teeth out and leave them in a cup in his locker. Right. For every game. Right. He's le and those, those well, teeth went missing. Mike French and John Levine, your two buddies. Uh, well, playing a whole year with him, I'm kind of, Kind of adjusted to the situation uh, being without him, but uh, sure it would be nice to have him back again, you know. But, uh, I'm sure we could do it without him, you know. We've gone the whole season without him, so today should be no different. Again against Greenberg of Hopkins. McEnany to Page and Page scores. Beautiful assist by McEnany. You know, it's, it's not fair uh, to match players because they're playing different eras, but I've yet to see a player that had feet and hands as quick as Eamon. I've seen good shooters. I've seen guys that can go to the cage. But his quickness and ability to function at top speed, I haven't seen anybody do that yet. His dad was the first, one of the first Irish runners to get a scholarship in the United States. And his dad came to Texas. So his dad was a runner. and. He told me one time when we were having lunch, he said, uh, I worked with Eamon when he was a little baby. I said, really? He said, yeah, we played footsie. He put his feet up against Eamon's and pushed his feet. And maybe that's the remedy that we now have to use to get somebody fast. His first year, he was playing football in the fall. So he wasn't at full practice. Second year is the same thing. The first year, freshmen were not eligible. Otherwise, he and Mike French would have set records that would never have been broken. And John Levine wouldn't have been too far behind. So they, they missed a full year of Austin lacrosse. The people that hold those records played four years. And you know his, his records would have been unreal. One thing I think about um, when I think about Eamon and I think part of it is because um, I was at the funeral in 01 and it's been 20 years and I've, I've talked about this before, but you guys must have been, you know, you're in a different place as someone really close to Eamon, but I, I will never forget Richie that day and the emotion and the pain and um, I think about what that relationship must have been like between coach and star player, guys with so much of the same background and the same high school and all that. When, when you think, Tom, about the Richie Amen relationship, how do you describe it? 
You know, it was a love-hate relationship, mostly love, but they were cut out of the same cloth. They, uh, they definitely communicated at a different level, but that also created, you know, emotional, you know, conflicting things also. But uh, Richie, I will say, really, really understood Eamon. And Eamon knew that. And they would communicate, you know, with all with all the other, you know, emotion that went into it. They could still communicate at a tremendous level. Uh, they both loved all things Irish, um, and they were, as I said, very similar. But they had a special bond. They had a special communi- you know, a special uh, relationship that, you know, I think. I can even say for myself, you know, we all felt we had that with Eamon. Uh, but the two of them, it was something, you know, really special. Yeah. I really think Richie really respected Eamon because as, what a, as a phenomenal athlete that he was, he worked hard at his craft, very hard. And everyone followed along. He led by example. And Richie, the Marine guy that he is, he yep. loved him. You really respect it. You know, Eamon came from a foundation. His two parents developed a foundation of kindness, generosity, love for one another, good Irish spirit. And Eamon had some talents that didn't come from his family. He was uh, very ferocious on the field. Uh, He would knock people down, pick the ball up, go to cage. Um, he was an unbelievable rider all over the field. But going back to his youth, when he was nine years old, he and his brothers used to come to my softball games. We had a league at Swanica High School. And uh, some of his friends and neighbors were playing for the other teams. So he became a heckler. So he started heckling me when he was nine years old. Little did I know, that he eventually was going to play for me. As I mentioned, he was an unbelievable leader and uh, very aggressive, very verbal. Sometimes I had to calm him down about the verbal. One thing I never tolerated was a player criticizing another player. But what Amy used to do is trash talk and go after that guy, like knock him down. So we had to have a number of talks on how to be polished, how to respect your teammates, and respect the program. And I said, if you can't do that, I said, we're going to have a divorce. And he looked at me in amazement. He said, well, that's the way I play. I said, the way you play is outstanding, but some of the stuff you do to make you outstanding is really not making you a teammate, and teammates are forever. And I don't want any of these people to dislike you. And he changed. Richie had a cast of characters on the team. And, you know, all the players, right, everybody. But the two biggest characters, practical jokers, were Eamon and Richie. And they were always playing practical jokes on each other. Um, it was it was all part of that relationship that you you know you referred to before. They were always playing practical jokes on each other, and that was all part of the environment. And St. Patrick's Day, didn't Eamon steal Richie's clothes? His clothes. He had yeah. no clothes to go home with, just a coat. <laughs> I, I I don't know if uh, you guys remember this, but um, it might have been sophomore year. Um, I was just wanted to be on the field so i didn't i forget who actually did it but remember he used to drink the diet cokes and he and he put them on the locker in that little room <clears throat> wait they didn't have diet coke in 1975 it must have been tab it was maybe tab. maybe, maybe it was tap maybe tab, whatever but <laughs> you're right we, you're right we used to get rick la france and he had this little thing we put a little hole right below the you know the hole in the in the coke we did this. It only worked once, and so he'd come in and right after practice, go like this. And all of a sudden, it's going. To the front of his shirt. 
Oh, that's funny. On April 1st, I posted it on the bulletin board, NCA is not going to permit players to play if their hair is outside the helmets. That was my rule, not the NCAAs. Well, he went down and got a haircut. And of course, the guy chopped him up unbelievably. He had curly hair, ringlets down the back. They would, they would cover his number, right? So uh, he gets a haircut, comes in the locker room, goes like this to the board, points to an NCAA rule. And uh, he says, how do you like this? I said, April Fools. It was April 1st. So, of course, they got a big kick from the whole team. The whole team loved it. And uh, so we always, pranks were very important. If you're going to be successful, have some fun, have some pranks. Like I use Old Spice, sure. right? So uh, one of the players coaxed by Eamon, took my Old Spice, put cream of Jesus on the top, my armpit almost burned off, all right? But uh, it, it was great. We did a travel. And the thing that I remember too is when I first coming into it, we used to go on the Sweat Hog Run, which was about a three mile run, very hilly on campus. You know, Jeremy went up through North Campus, around BB Lake, there were different routes, right? You go on that Sweat Hog Run, and, and again, I don't know all the numbers and all that, but I think it was around three miles. And we would come, the pack would come back. The pack would come back under 18 minutes. You know, bones would be there clocking people and stuff. Uh, but it was one of the most competitive things I've ever done in my life was running that sweat hog run. And different people would win it. And, you know, it just what, who felt good that day or whatever it might be. He was always right up there. I mean, he loved that run and he used to just be right up there all the time. Then we'd go to practice. That was like the, that was warm up before practice. And then you go to practice and practice. Chris, as he said before, was so competitive, you know, for the defense covering, you know, probably one of the best attacks that ever existed, you know, for 76. And he would be intense at practice and he wouldn't let anything go. And he would, with that, make people better. Everyone around him was better. And, and it wasn't just him. That was contagious. And that was sort of the, the way that we all got on each other in a very competitive, very positive way. But it left an, an impact. And, you know, I think what Mike said about, you know, that championship game, I mean, practice was more competitive than a lot of the games we played, especially, you know, back when, you know, the, there were a lot of Ivy League teams back then. It changed a lot now that just weren't really that competitive uh, for us. And it, practice was more competitive. No, no question about it. No, I, I, wish, I wish Chris would have stayed on midfield sometimes. But, uh, you know, it was really with, with what we had, with, with the experience and the, and, and the skills and, and the goaltending, it, it was – it was much more difficult playing all but maybe three games in my career, having practice, you know, against our own guys. When he did come out in the spring, um, the weather was not the nicest. Our practice facility was Oxley Arena, which was the uh, equitation center. Polo center, horses. Polo barns. You got it. So when the players came in, they went by 14 stalls of horses into the arena. Now, when we said Oxley Arena at the meeting before we started practice, all our freshmen thought, we're going to Madison Square Garden. Okay, they had no idea what they were in for. The only time we could get that facility was 10.45 at night. So we had different groups come in. 10.45, 11.30, 11.30 to 12.15. 12.15 to 12.45, and we got a lot accomplished. We played box lacrosse. Today, everybody's thinking box lacrosse was uh, something they, did, they discovered. Now, Native Americans play box lacrosse, Canadians play box lacrosse, Cornell lacrosse play box lacrosse, starting in 1969, indoors. And that really helped us develop. The astonishing thing is, when you got to the Oxley Arena, 
freshmen were given shovels and a broom because we had to uh, get the field prepared. Horses had been on it all day, and um, the manure was definitely on the surface, but it really helped the players. They learned how to scoop better. They learned respiratory, they kind of a respiratory problem. They all had to have tetanus shots, and uh, their legs developed unbelievably. It was the greatest training spot I could ever imagine. As a, as a family man, Bonnie, his wife, his four kids, how did you see Eamon evolve from that, that young superstar, not just lacrosse, football too, you know? And, and I think it's true, right? I mean, he, he nearly made the Jets roster. Um, what was that? In, in 77, right? Um, he did get a tryout, yeah. You got to try it. I, I think that was that was the year they had another receiver in camp, Wesley Walker, maybe too. It was tough making his receiver with the Jets. Seventy-seven. Um, but how did you see that young man evolve from from the star that he had been, the center of all attention, to you know a family man making the commute into New York and raising a family? How did you see that, Mike? Well, you know, I you know I, I know that uh, you know Chris spent. 10 years working with him and he had a better uh, scope on that. You know, I, I just saw him, you know, all of a sudden go from being a little crazy to, you know, mature, you know, with those cardigans on those sweaters, right. With that, uh, you know, like I said, <laughs> officerial look, right. Of a writer. And, you know, he had a, a great, uh, you know, Bonnie was my lab partner and, in school and he had, he had a great, great wife and mother. And, you know, he's got products like Kevin here. I, I just think that he, he, he transformed and took the responsibility, um, you know, to, to put as much time and, and effort into his work and with that commute and his family as he did to help uh, lead us, you know, to national championships. Yeah. He, he, did, yeah. he just redirected all those efforts. He redirected that and had the intensity with his family. He had the intensity with his friendships. He, in a, you're right, in a more mature, less right. emotional or less, um, spun, uh, I don't know, I guess just less emotional, but, but the same kind of intensity when you're around him, you know? And Kevin, as, as a son, you know, I'm sure you felt that, you know, and I'm sure you remember that, but um, yeah. He just translated it into different ways. I don't know whose idea it was. Eamon, Jay, myself, uh, had about 300 guys in this office down on Wall Street. And um, on Wednesdays, there was a, you know, decadence was running rampant in the 80s, right? And on Wednesdays, they would order Chinese food for 300 guys. Do you know how much Chinese food is left over after 300 guys, right? So Eamon, Jay, and I get together. We go, Eamon's the youngest out of eight. I'm the youngest out of five. We're like, this is like crazy waste. We gather it all up, bring it to the back of the building, find the temporary people who are out of their luck, and give them the food, plates, knives, forks. Other days of the week, you, order, you make your order for sandwiches and soup in the morning, 300 sandwiches, there might be 50 left over a day. In the back of the, in the, back of the uh, building, we got a whole follow. One guy says to us on a Chinese day, listen, I really appreciate this Chinese food. Do you think you can bring out some toilet paper? That's it, right? So he was also a big fan of people who were down on the luck. Nobody knew that. He did it for a good while. I played golf with him. We used to meet, not as many times as I wish, we used to meet at Seaview in Atlantic City. And not a calmer, more respectful, you know, you know person to play with at peace. You know, you know, he was really very much, you know, unlike some of the ways he played, 
when you were with him. He said to me one time, he said, the best part about golf is not the shots you make, it's between the shots. When you get to walk down the fairway, get to talk to your friends. You know, he's, he's a special, special guy. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys remember Eamon talking or, or him uh, sharing what happened at the time of the first bombing of the World Trade Center in 93? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, he, he was, ahead. you know, Go ahead, he was very matter-of-factly, yeah. very understated about what he did. And, you know, what he did was nothing but heroic. And he was just low-key. Yeah, I was scared out of my mind, ran to the bathroom, put all the, all the tissues in the water, grabbed them and said, let's go. And a lot of people don't know we even did that. When you try to pinpoint what is this man all about? He's about respect, trust, integrity, knowledge, and an, and an unbelievable heart. You know, he played football at probably 161, took a hard beating, but got up quicker. That was a motor, that was a slogan we had. When you get knocked down, you get up quicker than you got knocked down because he was scared of hell out of your opponent, all right? And when the f first bombing of the World Trade Centers, I was... Uh, 1993. Yeah, I was very worried about that. And to know that he helped walk 60 people down about 100 flights of stairs. The stairs had no lights in them, no ventilation, he had the men take off their dress shirts, give them to the women to cover their face from the smoke. And at every 10th floor, they counted off to make sure they had everybody. And when it got 10 floors down, they would switch the people from behind to the front. And this is all his ingenuity. This is all his ability to help rescue people. Now. I'm a great believer in God, and there's no doubt that particular day that God had his right hand on Eamon's shoulder to give him the knowledge and the strength to make sure everybody survived. The circumstances of Eamon's death in this national global tragedy, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's not an act of God, and I hate to put it this way, but these people were killed, intentionally killed. How do we, how do we find a way to appreciate a life that gave off such a positive, um, so much positive energy, such a positive force in the world, and not not dwell on what was what was so horrible and 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 vicious at the end. You fight that what happened when they got us so good that day? You just got to act like Eamon. Live the type of life he lived. It's the only way you can get back at him. I think over time, you know, we, we, we as we grew, we went wanted to obviously memorialize, you know, our, our love for Eamon and, and for others. I'm wondering, you know, Eamon was so young, only 46 on 9-11. And um, the first thing that comes to mind are those years lost, of course, with Kevin and his brothers and his sister. When you think about Eamon McEnany at 66, what do, you, what, what, what do you think that would be like, Tom? He, I know he was talking about, you know, he wanted to retire. He wanted to really dedicate his life to his writing. I know that's a path he really wanted. He was working on, you know, a screenplay or a play. Uh, he had just so many projects going on or in his mind. And that's really what he was looking forward to. So <laughs> my, my bet he would have followed through on all that stuff and been very successful at it because he was so passionate for it. One of the things that I remember this vividly with Eamon, you know, he used to talk about 
you know, inner city kids, sports, this and that. And I've talked to him way, way back when many times how, you know, bringing lacrosse, he used to say, when lacrosse comes to the inner city, we're lucky that we played when we played because we won't be able to you know, compete in the game anymore, you know, as the game just got more competitive. And, you know, what we're trying to do with City Lax is, is, is that. And Eamon would have been so proud and probably so involved, in the way you know, to be going. seeing. Exactly. Exactly. So I feel like that to me is a whole part of the extension uh, of where we're trying to go with City Lax, what we're trying to accomplish, bringing it into the middle schools uh, is our next move. And I know Eamon would be involved. There's no question. There's a couple aspects of this that I think he would really like. Um, I'm sure he would share the sentiment that I have that, you know, helping people uh, elevate themselves is a great cause. I, I think there's very little people who would disagree with that. But the other thing is, I think my dad recognized that um, he was, you know, despite his own success, he was just one part of, you know, a greater story that is the game of lacrosse. Um, you know, the more people that we can get interested in lacrosse, uh, the better, you know, I, I think, I think the pool of talent, there's so much potential there. And, um, it's, it's such a fun game to watch as is. It's just, it'll be amazing to see, um, you know, with increasing levels of talent where the game goes. Um, so I'm certainly excited about it. And I, I know that he would be uh, super, super excited to be part of this program. I just think he would have been so happy without his kids, how his kids turned out, how his life is going. He probably would have been pinching himself. How lucky am I? Kevin, how is your dad still a presence in your life? You know, I, I balance it out with, you know, so, sometimes I feel like, you know, growing up, I might have missed out on something, but um, at the same time, through, you know, these kind of like branches of connection that my dad had created, a, you know, I get to experience little bits of, uh, you know, little bits of his life, I suppose, growing up, you know, whether it be through the Mackinac family or events like this, or, you know, having the opportunity to go to Cornell and kind of experience in a different way, the same campus that he had growing up. Uh, it, it's, certainly had a strong influence on my life. And, um, you know, I just, I just try to, I just try to live up to, you know, that kind of example and, you know, be my own person, but also try to, you know, capture some of that, um, you know, the way that he lived his life. Um, yeah. Um, I just, it's, it's been, it's been a, it's been a really interesting experience and, um, you know, one of the one of the most poignant moments in my life in reflecting on my dad was, um, you know, when I when I finally graduated from Cornell in 2017. You know, I I, I definitely thought about you know what he would have, you know, what kind of emotion that would evoke if, if he was there. And uh, as I was walking out to Sholkoff, I uh, I saw his plaque, you know. At, at the stadium and uh, in a way it was just, it was, you know, it really felt like things were coming full circle. A great moment, Kevin. Yeah. Really? Great moment. Obviously, um, you know, after, after Eamon died, um, a book of his poetry was published and people who didn't know him as a poet got to experience that side of him. Uh, through through the book and and that you know you think of this tough as nails athlete two sports star um, all of that and then there's this other side to him this uh, poetic spiritual side um, Kevin ha have you read the poems uh, yeah I have and um, it's um, 
that that's something that you know especially when i was younger really helped uh you know when i was growing up it's it's a kind of unique opportunity you can have as somebody who who loses somebody to then you know be given this book that you know gives you an opportunity to sort of peer into their thoughts a bit and um there's there's a lot in there um a lot about love and, and laughter and, and there's a lot on death too and it's you know I, I feel pretty blessed to uh, have had the opportunity to you know hear his thoughts about the grieving process while I was you know effectively grieving him um, it's it I, you know I, I I have a I mean I have a copy of the book on my desk right now it's 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 uh it, it really means a lot, and uh, you know. I'm my copy um, right here too. <laughs> Ireland is known for outstanding poets, so somewhere in the bloodline of Eamon and his parents, dad born in Ireland, there's probably been a spark about his desire to be a poet and a writer. When I went to visit him in high school for the first time, he showed me some poems, and they were all about Ireland. And my mother and father came from Ireland. So I was very enthused, you know. Comes to Cornell, and unbeknownst to everybody, he starts writing poetry. In school, Professor Marcus is class. And Dr. Marcus came up to me and says, Richie, this guy's got some talent. He said, I'm really glad we accepted him here at Cornell. And I'm gonna, you know, nurture him and help him become a poet. Well, that happened in a classroom. On bus trips, he would write poems on sandwich bags, scrap paper, note paper. And he would write two or three every trip. And it would have to do with landscape, motion, uh, trees, and, and people. And this book captivated all those poems. And the great thing about it is when you love somebody, it's probably a lot easier to write poems. So when you write them, the one he wrote for Bonnie, for his wife, you know, it's stuff that every married man should look at. The one he wrote for his father, which is here in the book, is, is something that every man eventually is going to be a father, hopefully, if he desires to be a father. And to be a dad, you got to be a special person. And to have a son right about you, it makes it even more special. He wrote about love. That to him was the most important word in his vocabulary. Eamon's desire was to retire early, get a home in Ireland, spend time in Ireland, and write while he's in Ireland stay in Connecticut, main base, but get a home where it can go for maybe two or three months a year at different times. And unfortunately, it never happened. He, you know, I lived with him for two years. He was, he always had a book writing it, always. Something struck him, boom, writing in it. Maybe the bus, bus trips, he was always- he Always had a book with him writing in it. He's in a corner writing something in the corner, you know, where going to Dartmouth for eight hours or whatever we were doing. <laughs> he had a love of poetry as long as I know him. And the written word. What's interesting is the, the professor who actually wrote the foreword for the book, Ken McLean, he actually ended up being my uh, English professor at Cornell oh, didn't when know I was that. there. That's unbelievable. Wow. Ken's a yeah. great guy. Great yeah. Guy. I really enjoyed that class. Um, I got a B, so I don't really have quite the talent, but um, it was great. And, um, you know, I, I write poetry sometimes, but it's really for my own benefit. Nothing, nothing else really, I guess. Um, yeah.
You know, you know, I, I was when we were, I know we were planning for this, and you know, I, I, I got to be careful what I say because I, I say that I got many more assists from Eamon. I don't really remember the last one, but many more assists. You know, after we graduated, and I didn't see him as much as I wish I, I would have seen him. But you know, I have that book here, and and I have a lot of the books that he sent me. And I know he did it with a lot of other people. He'd send books <clears throat> and these remarkable letters and notes, and I have them you know, all in front of me. And you say yeah. special, like I got to be careful because I don't want Chris to start bawling. And, no. and, and, don't and, stop, uh, Mike. Don't and get no, me going. No, I know, because I'll, I'll, I'll be doing it too, but you know, he sent me this yeah. one book and you know, it's a famous golf book, Golf in the Kingdom which I'm sure many people have read. And it's really about, about a guy like Gaiman, you know, it's, it's, it's spiritual, it's uh, philosophical, it's poetic, and probably pretty much, I read it in 1996 when he sent it to me, uh, and a little over my pay grade, you know, because it's, it's you know, more in Eamon's professorial type of a, a thing. But, you know, he sent me a number of uh, notes, um, you know, uh, so I just said this one note I got from him with that book was about uh, this guy who wrote the book, Michael Murphy, and um, he goes to Scotland and he and he meets this golf pro teacher who becomes his mentor. And his name is Chivas Irons. If you've ever read the book, you know, so this guy, Michael Murphy, is uh being mentored by this guy. And so I got a, a, a lovely letter from Eamon saying that um, there, there were many Shivas irons in my life and you're one of them. So uh, the truth of the matter is that um, if anything, the opposite is true for me. So I just went down, because I, I have these these notes, they're, they're just precious. I have his books full of them. And yeah. he took the time and the effort. So when you talk about his ferocity and his fierceness and his competitiveness, you know, there was a real caring inside. He made me a whole bunch of Van Morrison uh, cassette tapes that I have. You know, he, he the way he ordered the songs, the way he just used to, he loved his music. He, as I said, he loved everything Irish, but he he knew so much about music, literature, and he loved talking about it and sharing with people. He really did. He was always talking about something that he was thinking about writing or was writing or was in the middle of it, always. I mean, the books are beautiful, but you didn't need that as proof that you know you were walking with a renaissance head. Half a mile from the county fair, the rain came pouring down. Me and Billy standing there with a silver apple crown. So we put our fishing rods and the tackle on our backs. when I think of number 10, I think of the line, perfect souls never die. And that how you treat people and the kind of person you are is more important than what kind of player you are on the field. When I see the number 10, I think of a selfless leader. When I think of the number 10, I think of energy and spirit. Eamon brought energy and spirit to everything he did, uh, and that's why I look up to him. When I see the number 10, I think of a legend. I think about a man who inspired all. I think about one of the best cross players to ever do it, and also one of the best teammates to walk the earth. When I see the number 10, I think selfless and a reminder that we can always be more selfless. When I see the number 10, I'm inspired to work harder to be a better teammate. When I think of number 10, I think of Eamon, who's one of the best lacrosse players at Cornell and was always going to give you an assist on or off the field. When I see the number 10, uh, it reminds me of all the stories uh, that Coach Moran has uh, shared with us throughout the years. 
of just the different ways that Eamon was a fierce competitor, but also just a loving and caring teammate. When I think of the number 10, I think of one of the greatest of all time, both on and off the field. While I've never had the pleasure of meeting Eamon, uh, it's, when people ask me, if there's one, pe one person you could meet that you haven't met, uh, Eamon McEnany is, uh, is top of that list. So uh, he's had an incredible impact on me just from hearing stories from his teammates, uh, his co coaches, the type of guy that he was, the type of player on the field, the energy that he played with, the passion that he played with, and, and what he did for his team. And uh, it's something that I tried to live up to when I was at Cornell and still do every day, uh, trying to be the competitor that he was. Uh, take his, his game and his teammates game to that next level and uh, wearing number 10 jersey uh, shirt underneath my my jersey every game was something that I did just to have Eamon's spirit there with me let him guide me because uh, he was he was the man and he uh, had a, uh, an incredible success at Cornell on the field but more so the person he was off the field and uh, my career would not have been the same at Cornell if it wasn't for Amy McNanny. It's the, that's the impact that he has had on me, even though I've never met him before. He's an amazing person, and uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to meet him. Amy would call frequently, and I think it was just the attachment that we had from his age nine all the way through Cornell. And... Um, the other players did the same thing, but they stayed in touch with each other tremendously. Um, when Eamon got hired, Jay Gallagher got him the job, and then eventually he moved to Canada Fitzgerald. But he never forgot his roots. He never forgot the man that doesn't have a lot. I'm going to help him get a lot. So he would go and hire people that were being turned down in other locations. And they turned out to be very, very successful. Um, the love that his teammates had for him, I don't know if it's ever been matched or will ever be matched. You know, it was so sincere. It still is to this day. I knew uh, nine young men who died in that tragedy. Very, very tough.
20 years ago, our nation went through ultimate adversity. In honor of those that we lost that day, City Lax has made the decision to make 2021 a year of remembrance of September 11th and the effect that it had on the lacrosse community as well as our country as a whole. The aftermath of the attacks on the World Trade Center was a moment of national unity. We believe that honoring that unity 20 years later is an important act in present day. As a byproduct of New York City lacrosse, an individual that remembers my parents losing 32 friends on September 11th, individuals they grew up with in Inwood, the last stop on the A train, individuals that I called my aunts and uncles. I know how vital it is for us to rebuild together after the hardship this city has undergone in the last year. We are asking for your help to spread lacrosse to student athletes in New York City, to change the narrative and unite us again. Let's do this together, one ground ball at a time. Thank you.